and welcome to the Wolfbox T10 Teardown video. And if you enjoy Teardown videos and want to see what's inside of different mirror dash cams, I have several more Teardown videos available on my channel. I'll put a link to those in the description down below. But with that being said, let's get started. Now this dash cam actually separated on its own, so I didn't have to pry it apart open. And the reason why it separated on its own is because the battery on it failed and that battery balloons up. And what that does as it balloons up, it forces the dash cam open and eventually got to a point that it, it literally, the front fell off from the back and it became unusable. And starting off with the display, you can see that there is a couple of ribbon cables and an identification label, which shows the part number being WTL and then a series of numbers. Now, I suspect the WTL is the manufacturer. This is clearly a day code. So you can see that this display was manufactured back in 2021. The other neat thing to notice about the display is that you can see that it is reflective, so it can be used as a mirror when the screen is off. And if you look at the current T10 that is being sold by Wolfbox, the T10 Plus, you can see that they have upgraded the display. So it is still reflective like this one. You can see that it works like as a mirror, but it has less glare because it's not as reflective. And here is the reason why this T10 failed, and that is the battery. As you can see, this uses a lithium battery to provide parking monitoring without hardware. And lithium batteries can sometimes degrade and balloon up. You can see how this balloon and pry the dash cam open. Now, what's really interesting is that while I've seen dash cams fail for a, a battery that degrades, I have, for example, a band up dash cam that is still running after all these years with no issues, even though it uses a battery. And I also have a separate T10 dash cam that also has not had a failed battery. So even though I have seen failures from a lithium battery, there are potentially dash cams out there using a battery that are still going strong today. And you can see on here that they are using an 800 milliamp hour battery. And this is identical to the part number and battery size that we saw in the auto wheel dash cam. Also notice that there is speaker for playing the sound is located on this side too. This is what plays sound coming from the video of the dash cam and on the left side we have the camera and on the t10 the camera happens to be of the slide out type so it can slide out in this manner and you can see how that happens over here with this ribbon cable that allows it to move back and forward also in the middle of the dash cam here so we have the main board and let's remove this tape to see what else is underneath here and as you can see sometimes this tape is just used to hold certain cables in place or anything else that you don't want moving and rattling around during the use of the dash cam and here's another good example of how this tape is being used as a secondary method of retention. You can see that this connector is holding on to this ribbon cable, but they also apply that tape on here as a secondary way to help keep this cable down. And with the tape removed, you can see where these ribbon cables used to be connected. This is for the display. This is likely data and this is likely power. But when the dash cam separated and the front fell off it, it literally ripped the cables from their connectors. The other question that I get asked is, can can the battery be replaced if it fell on a dash cam? And yes, technically it can be replaced. As you can see, it's just held back in here with some kind of glue or adhesive, and then it's soldered directly to the board. So likely desoldering this battery and installing a new one, soldering a brand new one in here should fix the issue. But let's move over to that front camera. I'm gonna go ahead and disconnect that by lifting on this little tab right here and pulling this straight out. And again, there's another little piece of tape on this side, and as you can see, that is holding on to the cable that drives the microphone for the sound recording functionality of this dash cam. Next up, there's a total of six screws that have to be removed for the front camera to be released. And now this plastic cover can come off. And here's a great view of how that slide out mechanism works. And that clicking sound that you hear is coming from these little tabs on these little ratchets. Let's go ahead and slide this thing all the way out. And to get to the actual sensor, there is one more screw I have to remove. But notice that I still can't remove the cover on there. So this is likely some kind of film that is concealing more screws. Let me try to remove this. And sure enough, there are three more screws that have to be removed. Let's try this one more time. Here we go. So 
same process again to release that connector. I'm gonna lift on this tab and I can pull the ribbon cable straight out. And here's a good close up of that front camera assembly. You have the body right here, the main front lens, which can be constructed from a combination of plastic and glass, and also the PCB board that holds onto the image sensor. And as you can see, to get to that sensor, there's a couple of screws that I'm gonna have to remove. But before I show you inside of this sensor assembly, I do want to show you what that looks like compared to the auto well sensor assembly and the Bantop sensor assembly. And this goes to my point that sometimes people think dash cams are all the same. And while they might follow similar design principles, as you can see, all three of the sensor assemblies are different. You can see that different PCB bar, different part number, and also the different tooling that was made to make the actual barrel. You can see that it is actually totally different. Same thing with the lenses. But now let's take a look at the actual image sensor. I'm gonna go ahead and lift this up. And the image sensor is located in the opposite side of this board. And then you have the lenses right here. And let's take a closer look at that lens assembly. I'm gonna pull this out from the barrel. And as you can see, you have the lenses right here. And then you have this little tread and barrel design. And this allows at the factory for this to turn so it can move in and out. And that is gonna set the focus for the front camera. Once the focus has been found, there is a little bit of glue applied right here, some epoxy, and that is gonna lock down the location of the lens so the front camera is in focus. And here's what that sensor looks like. Now I took measurements of this sensor and I was not able to identify it. So I can't tell you what sensor they were using, but for comparison, here is the Audible sensor and this is actually slightly smaller than this sensor so it is not the same sensor and here again for comparison is the Vantop sensor which is uses the massive IMX 415 image sensor capable of 4k and you can see on here the striking difference in terms of its size and its design now if I ever am able to identify what sensor this is I'll put that in the comments down below moving back to the main board there's actually only three screws that have to be removed for this thing to come off now let's get this thing off so we can take a closer look at it. In at the top of the board, we have the power input, the input for the rear camera, and then the memory card bay, and then the GPS antenna connector. And this shield is just held with those clips that you see on the edges of it. Now this type of shielding is normally used to prevent any kind of interference from coming out of the device or entering into the device. And in some cases, it's also used to cool the components underneath. Let's take a look at that. Nope, this is only for shielding. And there's a cover on the opposite side as well. Let's get this guy off. Again, here we can see that this cover is being used for shielding, but on this particular case, the cover is also being used for thermal dissipation. You can see that this tape right here is a thermal tape, so it transfers the heat away from this chip right here into this, which acts as a heat sink. But before I give you a tour of the components on this board, I do wanna show you what it looks like compared to the auto weld board and compared to the Bantop board. Now, if you've seen the video where I compare Bantop to auto weld, you know that there are tremendous amount of differences in the components on here in the placement and the layout of these boards and the same thing is going to apply here you can already see that there are some striking differences and i'm going to show you those in detail in addition the band top actually used a daughter board in addition to this main unit so while these things may look similar they're actually quite different once you get to know them closer but like all industries there are going to be some standardization and as you can see that for example you can see that here in the spacing of the connectors it is identical across all three boards that are coming from three different brands now a lot of the time standardization helps to have reduced cost and manufacturing and also let me show you why and here's what the brands are potentially saving by using standardization the tools that are used to make the cases those tools are usually made out of metal either steel or aluminum and those allow us to mold plastic and those tools are typically of multiple pieces so that way you can customize the case however if you are able to reuse certain portions of the mold then you're gonna save money as a manufacturer as a brand so there are likely gonna be cases where things can be reused for example in here you can see this section right here there is a line right here that line is called a parting line that means that this section of the mold is separate and you can customize it 
potentially with some other parts. But by using this section that already exists, the brand is saving money because they don't have to pay for this section of the mold to be made again. So what they do is they make sure that when they design this board, the spacing of these connectors is gonna be the same as what already exists out there. That way they don't have to pay for this part to be made. They can just use that existing one. But now let's move over to the fun stuff and that is the actual details of the PC board. First off, we can see that there are some empty lands or empty areas that can potentially be used to mount an additional connector, perhaps for a different configuration. You also have a number right here, 2017, likely indicating the time where this board was designed or potentially even manufactured. Well, let me bring your attention to this chip, which is the Pixel Plus PR2020. This is an analog high definition receiver. So this is likely taking the image from the rear camera and turning that analog signal into digital one for processing and also towards the top we have a smaller ic this is lp5304 this is an over voltage protection ic you can see that there's a lot of empty space around this board including another space right here again potentially for an other configuration it is not unusual for a company to design a board that can be configured with multiple components to produce different product lines again standardizing the board helps to reduce the cost of manufacture and then you can just produce different versions of it and moving towards the bottom left we also have this Winbond 25Q128 serial flash memory. This is likely what the software is being stored. And right below that component, we also have, again, space in here for potentially other items to be added or connected. You can see in here receiving, transmitting, or this could also potentially be used for testing at the factory. Another space for another connector that is not on this configuration or perhaps was designed originally to be part of it and later on was deemed to be unnecessary and on the other side we see the back side of the connectors but also notice that there are cutouts in the pc board that way the connector can sit in between the pc board reducing the thickness of the assembly this is again one of the reasons we don't see connectors coming out from behind a dash cam that will make the dash cam assembly extremely thick can it be done? Yes, it can. But what the manufacturers are trying to do, they're trying to keep mirror dash cams as slim as possible. But also notice that there is a date over here, 2020 or 331, and there is some model indication over here. So likely the 2017 number that we saw on the other side might be related to the board itself, and the 2020 could be this particular board design or board revision. And this button is what's accessible from the outside through a little hole on the case, which is used to reset the camera in case it was frozen and moving towards the middle of the board this is the start of the show this is an soc which is a system on chip high silicon 3556 in its v200 configuration this is where most of the magic is happening this is able to handle 2k video its big brother high 3559 is able to handle 4k but this configuration 3556 is able to handle up to 2k and the rest of the board is actually quite empty there's a lot of empty space right here more empty space right here and a couple of other components but nothing that particular stands out what's actually pretty funny is that you can see the remains of that ribbon cable that got janked out when this dash cam separated on its own. And now normally this is the way you would release it by pulling on the latches and then the cable can come out normally. But again, in this case, because the front separated, it ripped that cable straight out from the assembly. But the last thing I wanna show you is a close up of the battery because the battery actually has two parts to it. This is the actual battery cell. And what you see right here is the BMS or battery management system, which ensures that this battery is going to be charged correctly and as you can see because it has been ballooned there could be a temptation to want to poke a hole in it to relieve that pressure unfortunately lithium batteries can potentially catch on fire if the stuff inside is exposed to oxygen so it would be very dangerous for me to try to poke a hole in there and potentially cause a fire here in my living room but I also want to show you something interesting about this portion right here on the back of the case and remember the PC board was right here and there's a little bit of fat fabric behind it. Now the reason for that fabric is that there are plenty of holes right here which are for ventilation to keep that bore cool and this fabric is going to act like a filter so there is nothing that comes in here and can contaminate that PC board. Now on the auto well we saw similar ventilation actually quite a bit of ventilation right here different pattern in terms of how they made the holes but still the same ventilation and a large amount of fabric again to keep any kind of contamination out of there. Finally on the van top the ventilation 
is actually quite reduced. There's only a couple of lines right here, a couple of holes and right here. So there is not as much ventilation as these guys have. And also they are using some kind of metal mesh over here instead of fabric. And that again, to act as a filter to keep any kind of contamination out of entering the dash cam. But probably the most interesting part about this video is that it turns out that there's three different versions of the Wolfbox T10 as we know it. The very first version, what I call V1, is the one that I just tore down for you on this video and had the screen super reflective as I talked about earlier. Now I do wanna show you that the reflectiveness comes from the finish on the glass. It is not the LCD panel. The LCD panel is behind it and what changes the reflection over here is the coating that is picked at the factory when the dash cam front is manufactured. And the next one, which I call V2 or version two, is as you saw, has the upgraded screen with reduced glare. It still uses a battery and it still uses a mini USB connector. And finally, we have the latest upgraded T10, which is called the T10 Plus, or what I call V3. Now the T10 Plus has addressed a lot of the issues of the past, and that is because the T10 has been out for some time now. So they have gone away from batteries, no more batteries. Now there's a capacitor in here. So the potential for a battery to fill is no longer there on the newer T10 Plus. And also they have implemented USB-C connector for power instead of mini USB connectors. Now mini USB connectors are reliable. I have plenty of dash cams that are still running that, but USB-C connector is stronger, more durable than mini USB. So it makes sense that they have gone away from the mini USB connector to a newer connector. And there are plenty of other differences in the T10 Plus versus the older versions of the T10. I have a full review covering those. If you want to see that, I'll put a link to it in the description down below. And if you guys have any other questions regarding this, please put that in the comments also. I'll put a link in the description also to this dash cam in case you'd like to get one for yourself. And if you found any part of this video helpful, hit the like button to support the channel and stay tuned as I have a lot more dash cam reviews and teardown videos like this coming up for you guys. Thank you guys for watching and as always, I'll see you on the next one.